And so the three things that I like to think about when I'm like working on anything or any project is I feel, I feel really good when I'm, when I can be smart, uh, happy and useful. The, the last one's really, um, really important. Hello everyone, Ken here, back with another exciting video for you. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Daniel Burke. He's a fellow content creator and machine learning engineer. Daniel's from Brisbane, Australia, and you know he has a cool accent and he brings a very unique perspective about what data science is like in other parts of the world. Daniel is completely self-taught in machine learning, along with the help of quite a few online courses and certificate that he has found absolutely amazing. And he absolutely lives to experiment. In less than a year, he went from not knowing Python and driving Uber on the weekends to landing a machine learning engineer position. Aside from machine learning, his two favorite activities are writing and fighting. He's actually in the process right now of preparing for a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu grudge match. It's actually between him and myself. And whenever things open up, I think we're gonna, we're gonna get after a little bit and see who the better man is. Watching Daniel's YouTube channel or reading through his blog are not only fun and interesting activities, it can also make you a better learner, a better creator, and potentially fitter and healthier. Finally, he's currently the owner of YouTube's self-proclaimed best mullet. I don't think that's something I even want to consider challenging him for right now. So without further ado, let's jump into the interview. All right, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's really relevant to have you here because you know, my educational background with data science is very formal. You know, I've gone to school for two different master's degrees uh, to get, you know, into these positions. And you've come from a very different background where you were very much self-taught, but you made it very structured and, and very intuitive. And so I think that that is fascinating. And, you know, I obviously actually wouldn't recommend going the path that I took. So I think that, you know, everyone here is going to get a ton of value from your perspective, especially on learning this field. What I'd really like to start with is understanding, you know, how you got interested in data science and machine learning to begin with. Well, Ken, it is amazing to be here. Um, so yeah, how I got started to begin with, well, we kind of flash back to maybe, I think the start of 2017, so put it this way, I've always been a tech nerd, like just interested in technology in general. Um, and in 2017, I was working at Apple, but at the retail store. Um, so I was one of those geniuses, the ones that like fix your computer when you have, have something wrong. And I like loved that to death, but I got to a stage where I was like, you know what, I wanna start to, like I was working physically on the computers, whatever. I'm like, I wanna start writing code. Like I wanna start building apps and whatever on these machines that I'm, I'm servicing every day, iPhones, Macs, whatever. I wanna start building code um, or building anything really. And so I started to learn to code like three different times or maybe, maybe more, but I can remember distinctly like three. Me and a mate had an idea, like we wanted to build an app. So we were starting to, to, to learn to, to code for iOS because we had iPhones and whatever. That fizzled out after a couple of months. And then at the start of 2017, um, me and another friend, we were working out together all the time, but we kept running into this problem where I was signed up to, to one gym because I lived in another part of town and he was signed up to another. And every time we tried to like train together, there was, it was just a, a pain in the ass because you'd have to go to one gym and say, hey, I'm here visiting a friend. And they'd be like, oh, sign all this paperwork, et cetera, et cetera, just to get in the door. And so, me being a tech nerd, I was like, surely there's a way to, to solve this, like with just an app where you can just basically go to any gym that you wanted to. And we were like, why don't we just build that? Um, and so he had some experience building websites and whatever. And so I'm like, okay, well, this can be the third or fourth time I'm gonna learn to code. And this time I'll try to build something to, to solve our problem. Anyway, we got like three to four months into doing that. It wasn't really anything in depth web development. It was just like essentially a WordPress site that would show you a map of different fitness facilities in your area. And then you could like put in a form of what your details were all using just WordPress plugins. Um, but when we actually, here's the thing, when we actually started to go to gyms, we worked out 
that a lot of gyms revenue don't <laughs> results or comes from people not showing up. So our beautiful idea that we had prototyped and like, look at our website, we can get more people into your doors and whatever. We kind of didn't have the one thing that we needed and that was permission for, for people to actually use our website to enter the gym that they were like signing up for. Anyway, um, so after we kind of fi figured out that we had this massive roadblock and that was that our whole product and our whole idea depended on, on gyms um, and they didn't really want to help out, it kind of fizzled out. So it was called Any Gym. We had like this cool prototype going and whatever. It was all like web development. And I kind of got a little bit bored too by the end because I found like putting together different WordPress plugins to me was like, I'm not really coding here. I want to like, I want to actually write some stuff. Anyway, that was start of 2017. And at that time it was like peak, like ML, AI, data science in the news everywhere. And so I think if you if you get interested in any kind of development, you're going to hear these things. And so because I was learning the tech and whatever, trying to make it, that's all I could see. I was like, oh, machine learning is going to do this and all this sort of stuff. And then I figured out, okay, what's this machine learning thing? And then I realized I was like, oh wow, you you don't explicitly program the rules; the computer learns it for you. And so I'm like, well, after I'd spent a whole bunch of time like trying to place different CSS tags and HTML layout a website that looked really good. I'm like, you know what? This isn't really my style. Um, I'm going to jump into this machine learning thing. And so um, I, I did. I'm like, where can I start learning machine learning? I stumbled across Udacity. At the time, um, they just launched their deep learning nano degree. Um, and it was starting in like two weeks. And I decided to sign up. And then after I signed up, I realized, you know what? I haven't got any of the prerequisites that I need. So um, I, I then started learning Python like two weeks before uh, entering the deep learning nano degree. And um, basically finished every project like four days late um, of the deep learning nano degree because I was trying to learn Python at the same time as code deep learning models. Um, but at the end of that, that was about three months, I think. And so now we're halfway through 2017 and I was like, you know what? I really love this. I'm going to study it properly rather than just sort of floundering around because the deep learning nano degree was kind of for me just a, a hello world to the field. Um, and so I put together my own artificial intelligence. I'm saying this in inverted quotes if you're listening to this. Um, artificial intelligence master's degree where I collected different resources from online and said, you know what? I'm going to study this for the next foreseeable future um, and see where it goes. And then I guess that was uh, the inception point. And now we're, that was almost, I would say three years ago, probably almost this month that I started that AI master's degree. And now we're here. It's been, uh, <laughs> it's been good fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, you know, one of the things I love most about your story in general is that you, you really clearly have a bias towards action. I mean, even though, you know, you, you started to learn coding, you know, three or four times and it fizzled out, you at least started, right? And it takes a couple, it takes like starting to learn something a couple times for it to actually gain traction. Um, and, you know, like your initial introduction to this field is because you wanted to build uh, this, this any gym platform and you did it right without necessarily having the prerequisites or anything like that same thing with the the deep learning nano degree is you jumped in uh, you know at least feet first and uh yeah i think that that's something that bias towards action is something that could really take um anyone interested in this field very far because you know if you if you get if you get past the worrying about where to start uh, it's so much so much easier to learn so, you know, one thing that I'd love to talk about is your just, you know, before your, your self-created master's degree, what was your education background like? You know, I get a lot of people like, what should I study in college to get into this? Um, and, you know, I kind of think, um, and you're a perfect example of this, maybe it doesn't matter as much as you think. Yeah. Well, just just to touch on that, I think if I read the prerequisites for for the deep learning nano degree, if I before I signed up, I might not have signed up. So <laughs> that's kind of like a little bit of blind ignorance there, um, but it all worked out. But um, yeah, what I studied so beforehand, um, I've actually had quite an eclectic 
put it this way, I finished high school in 2010 and then I, I started university in 2011 um, studying a, a biomedical science degree. So basically in Australia to get into medicine, which is uh, what I, I thought I wanted to get into, um, you have to, you need, if you can't get directly in and to get directly in, you need some ridiculous like test results and all that sort of stuff. And I wasn't that person because in, in high school, I preferred to play Call of Duty than study. Um, and so I signed up for this biomedical science degree, which is kind of like the stepping stone to get into medicine. And truth be told, like the only real reason I, I chose that was if I reflect back was because one, a girl I kind of had a crush on was studying it. And two, I thought it would be cool to tell people um, I was studying to be a doctor. So it was more of a, it was more of a status thing and just following this, this cute girl than uh, me even considering what I, I wanted to learn. And put it this way, I really didn't know. <laughs> like I was just, yeah. I just thought that, that going to university after high school was the thing that you do. Um, I really didn't know any better. Anyway, so I studied that for two years and failed pretty miserably because um, first of all, I didn't do any biology in high school. So I was again trying to like learn pre-medicine biology in university at the same time as uh, I remember actually one of the, in like the first lecture of the biology introduction is the, the lecturer was like, look left and right because 30% of you are gonna fail. That means one out of three of you aren't gonna pass this course. And I looked to my left and right, and I'm like, that's not gonna be me. It turns out it was me. Um, and so that was like two years. The first two years, um, I had to have a meeting. I got an email one day from the science dean, which basically said, hey, come see the science dean about your results. I went and saw him and it said, and he said, look, what's going on with your results? It was basically like a, why should we keep you at university kind of thing if you're just gonna fail all of your subjects and, and not pass or whatever. And I was like, oh, whoa, this is actually kind of serious. <laughs> um, and so that was like a, a good wake up call actually. Um, and so I gave a bunch of excuses like why I wasn't doing too well. The real reason was just because um, I was just lazy and I, it wasn't, I wasn't studying the thing that I was, that naturally sparked my interest. And I mean, of course, I could have actually got into it and then it probably would have, the interest would have came later after I got better at it. But I found myself on the side. I was into, I was into weightlifting and, and a heap of sports. I found myself, rather than studying for the exams I had at university, I was like researching hardcore online. I'm talking, watching YouTube till like 11 p.m. at night later of just um, how people would eat and, and train for different sports. So I was getting really into nutrition on the side. And then I kind of told the, the science dean, I was like, he, oh, he asked me, do you want to change to anything? I'm like, well, I've been learning about nutrition. Can I study that? And he's like, yeah, why don't you just change to study nutrition? And I'm like, huh, so you mean I can just change to this thing I'm already studying on the side and like do it properly at university? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. And so the next semester, which was, I think the start of 2014 maybe, because 2011, two years failing, and then the next year, anyway, the years don't really matter, but as after the two years of failing, I switched to nutrition and food science and basically got top marks without even really trying because I was already like, studying this hardcore on the side, like watching videos, reading books, trying experiments myself. And that's, and that's, I think the biggest takeaway I actually got from university. So I ended up graduating in 2015 with a food science and nutrition degree. It probably would have been like honors or whatever, not that I really cared, but because my GPA was already uh, so low from the first two years, it kind of, it wiped out any chance of getting like good marks later on. And so 2015, food science and nutrition, and then 2016, before I started studying deep learning and machine learning and data science in 2017, I actually studied um, languages for two years. I mean, a year. So Chinese and Japanese. I've, I've basically forgotten it since then um, because if you don't use it, you lose it, right? 
But the biggest takeaway I got from university, I think was learning how to learn. And you don't necessarily need this to go to college to, to get that skill. Um, but once I figured out like that, that light bulb moment of sitting across the science stand going, Hey, you can, you can study this thing that you're already interested in. That was like, like just a mind shattering moment for me. Cause that's what sort of got, went and told me, like I learned the lesson. I was like, wow, I can, if, if there's something I'm interested in, I can just go and learn that. Like, I don't necessarily have to follow any set pathway. Like, it's just like, oh, there's that thing. You know what? That's already sparking my curiosity. I'm going to go try it out. And that's kind of the exact same, like learning how to learn lesson that I applied to machine learning that kind of got me to where I am now. I mean, that's awesome. It's shocking that we, we have a uh, pretty similar educational backgrounds in, uh, in college, I think I went through like at least four, maybe five different majors. I was yeah. an awful student. And then I, I transferred <laughs> schools for, for, for sports and I started studying economics and I just earned like top marks all the way out. Cause I thought it was like fascinating. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, th that's one thing that again, for anyone watching us, I think that is a really big takeaway is that when you're in school, I mean, if you want to do data science, it does help to go certain paths. But for example, if you're choosing between like statistics and computer science, like 100% do the one that you're more excited about, right? If you're excited about the coursework, if you're really interested in learning it, you're going to put so much more effort into it. You know, if you don't really, yeah. I mean, if, you know, some sort of, um, you know, like uh, object oriented programming isn't going to like really get you excited if that's like what your whole degree is based on probably not going to try too hard in your classes and you're probably not going to use it too much outside of outside of what you're doing so like i i really like that and i think we're both lucky in the sense that we found something we were really excited about and were able to experience that because so many people they were in the same position that you were where you were studying something you didn't like and you know, they're doing enough to get by and they graduate and then they're like, oh my God, what do I do? I don't like anything. Um, yeah. So I think that that's like a very, um, um, a very important, important idea. So after you, you know, were, were struggling through this deep learning nanom degree, when you really started kind of getting into to the machine learning education, what type of concepts did you start with? You know, was it, uh, did you start with some, some kind of projects? Did you start with, a, you know, a couple different courses? What, what are the beginning steps look like for you? Or what would you recommend beginning steps to be for someone that is, again, trying to learn this field from scratch um, as like, who, who hasn't had exposure to it? Yeah, well, so yeah, it was, I was kind of learning Python at the same time as the deep learning nano degree. So I, I distinctly remember actually one of the first concepts that I came across was um, like co convolutional neural networks. And I remember sitting on my friends. Uh, so this is like, okay, so the way, the way I sort of prefer to learn is with anything is just trial and error. Like I like just getting hands on as soon as possible. I can't sit there and go through theory to begin with. For me, it's just like, I need to set up an, a string of experiments to even get interested in something. Um, and so what I really liked about the deep learning nano degree was kind of like a, just threw me in the deep end basically. Um, and I remember sitting on my friend's bedroom floor. Uh, this is like the friend that we were, I was hanging out with heaps while, cause he was like my partner in building the, uh, the web startup that we we're working on. And I was like, just coding away on the floor. And I like got up and I showed him, I'm like, dude, look at this. I think it was a, like an image classification model on the CIFAR 10 data set or something like that. And I'm like, look at this. The, the computer knows that this is a photo of a plane and this is a photo of a dog. And if I, if I press shift and enter, which is the Jupyter notebook, of course, and it, it, it feeds it another image, it says like, this one's a dog, but I haven't told it what's an image of, of what. It just kind of, well, Technically I have, it was supervised learning, but it just like, it figures this out for itself. And he's like, whoa, that's insane. And kind of like, I was like, yeah, this is really cool. And so I was like, that got me hooked, right? Because I, I figured 
that's what a lot of like machine learning and data science is, is like, especially when you code in like a Jupyter notebook or something like that. Okay. Everyone's got like a different opinion of like where you should, um, like people like IDEs and you should write scripts and all that sort of stuff. But I, I really liked, maybe that's why I failed to learn to code a few times because it was just in a, in an IDE, in a script and to get the results, you kind of needed to, you kind of need to compile the program and have it almost ready to run. Uh, end yeah, to Python's end. perfect for you. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, when, uh, when I was figuring out like that machine learning and data science was just a whole bunch of just small little experiments to try and find something, I was like, boom, this is, this is me. Um, and so in saying that what I found worked for me was combining, doing the experiments first and then digging deeper in, into like what the theory was. So for example, um, I mean, I used Udacity. There's a whole bunch of, of different resources out there. For me personally, like I, I, for, the, for a lot of people, Udacity is, is quite expensive. Um, but I found that once I had invested that much, I was taking it a lot more seriously, even though I'd already spent like a whole bunch of money at, at university um, on like loans and whatever, I, cause I couldn't really see it. Um, I didn't take it as seriously because I'd like physically seen me put my credit card or debit card into like Udacity's payment portal. I was like, oh sweet, this is, uh, this is actually taking my money. So I'm going to take this really serious. But then I, um, and that's not to say that anyone has to, we're kind of getting off track, but anyway, paid resources, free resources, it doesn't really matter. They're all great. But that was just, that's just me personally. Anyway, I found that I was using a combination of, okay, do the heap of experiments. And then I found it a lot easier to go down into the, the rabbit holes of the theory because it was like, okay, on the left here, I've got the experiments that I've running. And I was like, well, why is that coming out like that? And then, so I would go and dig in and I'll go, oh, okay. So there's the, the math behind the loss function that I'm using, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, and I, in fact, that's actually still how I learn. Like it's, I'll, I'll open up some sort of notebook or whatever, and I'll go through a series of, of tutorials or experiments hands-on with code so I can actually see what's happening. Um, and then if I don't understand something or if I want to dig deeper or push something to its, its limit, then I'll go find another resource, combine that and go, well, here's a theory behind it. And then it'll just be like a building block from there. But it's always, it's trial and error driven. I don't learn any other, any other way. Like it has to be trial and error. Um, so I got started with a bunch of courses to do, to learn foundational skills. But where I started to really learn is when I started to build my own things or own projects. And so I got really fortunate to, to get some experience at a machine learning company in my, in my city. And basically that's all we did. We, we, um, we worked on six week projects. And this is why I kind of think it's, it's uh, like if you're learning whatever it is, like courses, all the courses online, basically all of them are great. Like it actually doesn't really matter um, where, cause it's like all the same code, just- I, I hear yours is particularly it. good though, so. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll plug that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, find someone who you resonate with, with in terms of can explain whatever concepts it is and, and just, use use that resource as your foundational skills um now this is me looking back and like how how i could have how i how i did and whatever and then i actually yeah going back to the role we were working on six week proof of concepts with different companies and so all it was was i would take the things i'd learned in courses and various blog posts and various books and whatever and then would apply them straight away to to some sort of project we were actually trying to solve and then if, if, if we didn't get as good results in the project we wanted, it'd go back to the, the theory or back to the research or whatever, and then back to the project. And it was just like back and forth in a, in a pendulum type motion. So that's like a long winded answer of kind of how I got started versus with, uh, in terms of like concepts versus theory versus uh, whatever style. Um, 
to sum it all up is basically just run as many experiments as you can. Your main, your main, in terms of learning, your main like thing or your main idea, your main goal is to reduce the time between experiments that you do. So if you're like, if you're like setting something up that's, especially when you're first getting started, if you're like setting something up that's like massively long and elaborate, something that'll take longer than a weekend to do, you're probably like overcomplicating it. Um, and so that's like what I, I tell people sort of if they're starting to learn right now is like, okay, courses are great for foundational skills, but if you want to build upon those foundational skills, you have to put them into practice somehow. And that can be through a project or through whatever. Um, the term project is very, very, very broad. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, what do I do? What if it's not new and all that sort of stuff? Well, take something that already exists and just replicate it. Um, and then you'll, you'll understand it a lot more than just looking at it. Awesome. Well, you know, one thing I really like that you said is that, you know, is reducing the time between the projects or, or the time of iteration. You know, a lot of people think they have to sit down and do a whole data science project, you know, the collection, the cleaning, all these different things. Um, in one sitting right and yeah. that's not that's not how it works i mean when i made the data science project from scratch series which i i hope is one of the more helpful resources related to this i took each section you know like the data collection the data cleaning the eda model building all these things and i they felt like individual projects to me right like i did one at a time and i spaced them out and they you know each one didn't take more than three four hours at a time and you know, to your point, it's like, look, I can break a big project down into these little sub projects. They still count as projects on you or like one big project when you put them together. But when you work, try and have like discrete starting and ending points for, for each, you know, part of the project that makes it so much more manageable uh, and so much more kind of uh, attainable at the same time. One thing that I, I'd really like your thoughts on is that, you know, the whole thing with experimenting is trial and error, right? One of the things that I think a lot of people struggle with is when they get stuck, when something isn't working. What are some of your best recommendations for, you know, getting you know, like dealing with the failure, which is very common in data science when your your stuff doesn't run or when you're not getting as good results, even though you're in theory using better models. Um, you know, how do you get past that? How do you, you know, what what encourages you to keep going and, and keep experimenting? Yeah. Um, what I do recently, actually, if like I'm running into a whole bunch of bugs, is just uh, like take a break. Like I literally go outside, go for a walk. It's like it's it's simple. It's like there's I don't. I, I would always I would always find myself actually in terms of asking myself that question that you just asked, and I um, uh, I would always look for like some sort of secret. You know, like how do I, how do I find the answers out of all this? And like reflecting back on it, it was like, you know what? This, this this happens to everyone it's not it's not new like you're gonna run into I mean truth be told if you're not running into errors you're not trying enough things so it's like part of the parcel um, one one big thing actually that I like to do is if I'm working on any kind of project it's always it's always more exciting or easier to get back into it when you when you know what your next steps are and i mean you're not always going to know it right so if i'm working on something oftentimes i'll um I'll, like if i'm writing a code cell in jupyter notebook i'm actually doing this now with something that i'm working on is that if i'm like going to take a break or something i'll like leave a code cell like half half done and then i'll write like a comment like my code will be just for a simple example model.fi and then like for fit and then it'll be, uh, I'll just do model.fi and then hashtag like for the, I'll comment the comment, out. Yeah. It's like finish, finish this, um, finish this. Like that's my next step. And then so I'll come back and if I look at, if I'm searching in a project, I'll often do command F and then I'll usually have next or up to here. And so then I can just like go back to it and sit down and just go command F next. And then literally just like start going back on the exact same part even though it would have taken me like 30 seconds to, um, to finish that before I took a break. Um, 
having that little bit of like unfinished business is kind of like a, a momentum builder for, for getting back into it. And so oh, okay. I'll even do that when I'm writing as well. Like almost, almost, uh, I, I found it's really helpful, but where you run into like, where I personally run into, I mean, it's probably similar to a lot of people is when you're not sure of what to do next, then it's really hard to like sit back down and, uh, and like dig into it. Maybe you've ran into some sort of CUDA error and which is like, like the formidable error. And uh, no. you've like, you've like, you've been through almost every single GitHub thread that exists. And you're like, well, I just can't get this error fixed. And then you just work out that your just tenses were in the wrong shape, like at two days later. Um, I've had that happen to me multiple times. But you know, <laughs> I, I think that there's a lot of value in that is that you know, sometimes in the moment or when you need it, you don't, you're not going to solve the problem and you should give yourself a certain amount of time to solve it and then just move on. You know, some people yeah. get so stuck that they stop altogether. Um, you know, one thing that I do is very similar to what you do is that I'll just like do like six comments. Like these are the six things I'm going to try. If like some of them work, if one of them works great, I can keep going. If none of them work, it's like, okay, I, I tried everything that I could. Let's move on to a different part of the analysis or like, let's just step away for a little bit and think of more things that I can do. I mean, there's yeah. like, um, you know, I, and if I, in doubt, I, like ask, you can always ask, like yeah. I find the amount of, so for every question you probably see on like stack overflow or some GitHub issue thread, there's probably like a thousand that are unasked. So if you are, if, if, if everything, and this is what I found actually too, like if you start to, to phrase like the problem that you're having in like English terms or like just in, in, in semantic terms, um, like talk it out, it actually starts to, to make more sense. Like when you, or sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So I would have, when I was uh, programming, working on another project with someone else, um, he introduced me to the concept of the rubber duck. Um, and so it would, we would treat each other as if we were rubber ducks, like sitting in the, in the bathtub. And then we would explain our problems like, oh, rubber duck, I'm trying to, to merge this data frame with this other data frame. And I'm not sure like the order that it's supposed, oh, wait, I should just go on that column. And oh, oh, I see what I have to do now. And so <laughs> like that actually, so, so yeah, what, what you just said of like leaving six comments or whatever, that's kind of like a similar thing. It's like, um, you're just talking yourself through your own problems. And it's the same thing with um, one of the recent projects that I worked on. I had this document that was basically just like a, a thread, a rolling thread of whatever thought came into my head about the project. And it was, so I was like, um, I, it went for 42 days, which is like six weeks. And it's like day one, this is what I did. And I literally, it was like a journal. And then it's like day two, this is what I'm going is, to do on day is two. Is this your Airbnb project? Yeah. And so uh, that's, I'm that going to leave that above and below just for, for everyone. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that was, going on. that was something I like started doing when I was working at my machine learning, um, engineer role was every day I would kind of, um, uh, send a message through on Slack, just saying, here's what I did. Here's what I'm going to do next. Um, and those, like, it was just three bullet points. Like, here's what I did, like three bullet points, maybe less if it was only one big thing for the day. And then the the next was kind of like, here's what I think I'm gonna do next. And it was out in the public, like it was with the whole machine learning team. And that way it was one, first of all, it was communicating to myself, my intentions. And second of all, it was like, well, hey, this is out in the open. If anyone kind of has advice or disagrees, well, it's it's right there. So you can you can interact with it if you like. You know, it's it's funny. I do that every night before I go to bed in my little journal here. It's a little <laughs> embarrassing, but I write down uh, at the top here all the things that I did, like pat on the back type stuff. Over here, yeah. I write the things that I learned. And then below, I talk about what I'm going to do the next day. I think that that's like a really good practice. And you also look, if you look back over the, like over a year, you could say, holy, you know, I learned so much over the course of this year, even though if you're just kind of thinking about it and you're not tracking it, you're just like, oh, you know, I guess I learned some machine learning concepts, whatever it is. It's, it's, it's nice to keep a list of the things that your accomplishments, because we very much forget about those things. Uh, you know, there's two other, other concepts I wanted to kind of touch on with you is, you know, 
U of all people, I think does a really good job of tying your interests into your, your work and into the content that you produce. I'd really love to know, you know, how you're able to do that. Like if, if you have some recommendations of finding like project inspiration, I mean, I, I got so many people that ask me, Hey, Ken, like what project should I do? And my always answer is always like, do stuff you're interested in. But, you know, again, you, I think you've done a really good job at like learning about yourself and understanding what makes you tick. And then you're able to transfer that into to a machine learning project or something else. Do you have any kind of insight on, I mean, I guess that was really vague, but on, on that kind of idea. Yeah, well, yeah, my, my advice generally too is for the projects is find something you're, you're curious on. Because at the end of the day, it's, um, it's also the, it's the something that might not work. That's what intrigues me a lot. So something that might not work. That's, I think, what stops a lot of people as well. It's kind of like a paradox. It's like uh, the best projects are things that might not work, but what also stops you is because you, you, you can't really forecast how it's going to turn out. And I think if you ask like anyone who's worked on anything worthwhile, it probably hasn't turned out exactly what they thought because chances are like you'll, you'll start and you'll be like, yes, I'm going to build this amazing thing. And then like, for example, I listened to um, like a pretty in-depth podcast with uh, Elon Musk the other day. And I mean, if you want a great example of just like a company or, or someone who's building something that went through a heap of adversity, I'm pretty sure everyone knows Elon Musk. So you can, you can go check out the history of Tesla and see, wow, okay. They had this, they had this overarching goal, but like the steps that to get there were just like, just insane. Like they had to change. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so at the end of the day, that's, what's going to happen with whatever project that you're working on. So if it's going to happen to, to a company, uh, that, that at the moment looks as incredibly successful as, as Tesla, well, it didn't start out that way. So that's the same with no matter what, and I'm not saying like whatever project you want to work on, it's like compare it to, to the one you worked on. Like the, if you're, if you're worried about like, oh, this is not the, the latest and greatest, because these are the worries that I have. If it's not the latest and greatest thing, or if it's like not, not mind blowingly new or whatever, it's like, no, don't, don't, don't compare like your progress to someone else's progress because like it's, 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 it's two different lanes. It's two different things. And so the three things that I like to think about when I'm like working on anything or any project is I feel, I feel really good when I'm, when I can be smart, uh, happy and useful. The, the last one's really, um, really important. So it's useful to, to others. So I like to think about in terms of, okay, what's going to make me feel smart that I'm working on? like whatever project, because that's intellectually challenging. What's going to like keep me happy. So again, part of that, that keeping me happy is like that intellectual challenging. Like it's kind of like a circle. It's not like three separate categories. And then useful is like, what's something that, that when it's finished, um, that would be either useful to, to me six months ago or useful to, to someone else who, who might, might want to learn more about whatever it is that I'm working on or be entertained because that's kind of like the crossover, right? It's like if whatever project you're working on, it kind of, it needs to serve a purpose. It needs to educate someone or it needs to entertain some, some of them have the combination of all three. So I go back and it's like, okay, something that might not work. It has to be, cause that's intellectually challenging. If I know exactly how it's going to turn out, well then that's kind of boring to me. Um, I only really learn anything when I'm surprised. Um, and so, it's got to keep me happy. So it's got to be like something that I, that aligns with my, my values and, and interests. And three, it's got to be useful in at least some way. Um, and so, so useful again, is, is a broad term. And so I could, I could work on an entire project just to have a blog post skeleton of what it's like to work on your own project. Even if the project turns, turns out to be null and void, like whatever result I was going for, it turns out not, not possible. Like the whole purpose of the project could be to have that blog post and go, you know what, here's what I learned. Here's the steps I went through, take it or leave it. Um, if you're working on your own project, here's the things that, that I did that may, may not work for you, may work for you, but there's a, there's a story attached there. So yeah, smart, happy, useful, and things that might not work. That's, uh, that's my take for projects.
Well, you know, I, I really like that. I think a lot of people are scared of failure. And what, you know, you don't realize is that I, I think data scientists are characterized by their failures. Like a good data scientist has failed more than, than other data scientists who are not as good. Because you, it's about experimenting, it's about trying new things. And if you're worried that, oh, I didn't get great results, I can't put this on my resume, that's not true at all. I want to see a project. I want you to put projects that that didn't turn out as you thought they would on your on your in your portfolio or on your resume. That's something that shows that like you're human. That like you realize that not every project you're going to get a great result. You know, I I think that we might be programmed a little bit differently um, just because of of our experiences. You know, I I relate a lot of things to sports. I played golf growing up, right? And golf is a game that's characterized by failure. Like the greatest golfer ever has won less than 20% of the tournaments that he's, you know, participated in, right? And mm. and to me, like, you know, I won a lot less than that, right? And so, you know, with data science, like you start out and you, um, you know, you, you don't, you're not successful with like the first 20 models you run. You're not successful even after you run like a grid search sometimes. I mean, there, there's a bunch of different things where you're gonna keep failing, keep failing, keep failing. And then you'll finally maybe get something that you're like content with, right? I don't think I've ever had a model and been like, oh my God, like this is the greatest thing. Like the, the results are well beyond my imagination. Um, but you know, it's the same with, for example, your experience with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, right? Is you go to the gym, if you're working with people who are more experienced, who are, um, you know, who are, are leveled up further than you, you're basically just getting your ass kicked every day. And like, yeah. That's part of the learning process though. So you, you never go home and you feel defeated. You're like, wow, like, you know, these people that I'm working with are, are better than me now. But yeah. like I got better because I worked with these challenging people or I worked or I got better because I worked on these really challenging problems. So- Well, uh, it, you're exactly right. Like I think the other night I was talking to my coach and I'm like, I actually prefer to be told when, like, don't get me wrong, I'm human, I like praise. I like people going, oh, you're doing a good job and all that sort of stuff. But I actually prefer like to be told like when I'm doing something wrong or when it could be better, especially if it's someone who's like got got more experience or something like that. I actually, I actually like an older version of me would have, and don't get me wrong, like I'm, I'm not, I'm human. Like I've still got like the ego and whatever. And it's like, if someone tells you, oh, you could be better or you're doing this wrong. It's like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take that in, take it on the chest. Um, but yeah, if it's, it's in terms of, if it's someone, especially if it's someone who, who has your best interest in, in mind, like if they're offering like, Hey, this is some feedback, like a potential for you to be better. It's like, that's like a gift. Like that's like, here you go. Well, if you want to, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is a great example. Like I was, I was literally talking to my coach the other night. I was like, where, where am I going wrong? Where could I improve? Um, and so I think that's for, for almost anything. Like if you're working on whatever project, you share it out and you're going to get like, let's be real though. No one's, no one's like, if they are like being like hateful or, or saying, Oh, this didn't work and all that sort of stuff. Well, that, that's like null and void. That opinion doesn't matter whatsoever. <laughs> like, because most of those times, they're those sort of comments and whatever, or either don't happen because people are generally like, this is just my experience with putting a lot of things out online. People are generally like nice. Um, and if, if they do like come across as that, well then at the end of the day, it's like, well, that well, I, I, understand how that person's feeling because I have also looked at other people's work and gone, you know what, I'm jealous of that because my skill level isn't there either. So my first reaction is, is wow, that, that person must have had, had this uh, advantage or they've got, I don't know, whatever. I'm trying to pick out the flaws in whatever they're putting out because realistically, they're just the flaws in, in my own skill or my own character. Um, and so there, that's what I'm quickest to see in, in other people. But I've, I've since, I'd like to think, I'd like to believe that I've got better at that. Um, but, but I mean, it's a, it's a work in progress, right? But yeah, with these things, it's just, if someone's pointing out, it's like, Hey, where you're, as long as it's not like malice or whatever, it's like, well, your work could improve here. That's like, who doesn't want an opportunity to, to that's improve? That's gold, right? Yeah. 
Well, you know, I, I have to quick pause. I really want to give a lot of credit to all the people who I've done resume review and project reviews for. They've taken criticism like incredibly well. And like, uh, I mean, I absolutely commend them for that. Not a single person yet has been like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, like there's been no pushback, which I'm okay with pushback. I'm not always right. But um, I really want to thank everyone who's who submitted for that as well. Um, you know, one that more thing guts. that, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, to put, it's kind to of, put your, to put your stuff out there, it takes guts, man. So yeah. that's, that's kudos, kudos from, from me to them as well. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it kind of goes to something you were talking about it. I am really impressed with people when they're not all that sure of their work yet and they still put it out there to be judged because you know that, I mean, that, that takes some, uh, serious guts. Like you said, I mean. If, if we're talking I'm more about like with that, yeah, that like, nothing, no, actually nothing impresses me more than, uh, than someone trying to fulfill their potential. Like that is yeah. the most beautiful thing in the world to me. That is awesome. Um, so, you know, one thing in terms of filling potential, a lot of people view that in terms of job success, right? I would love to hear about your, uh, your job experience you know, how you ended up in your machine learning engineer role. I think that that's like very interesting to a lot of people. And I think your story could also really help them understand what they could do to put, you know, potentially land a job that, that they've been dreaming about. Yeah. So a question I get asked a lot is what am I going to get asked in a, in an interview? And I don't really ever have a good answer because the only tech role I had, I didn't really interview for. Um, and so I'll just, I'll just tell the story of how it happened. So I was learning, I was studying my online AI master's degree, like in this same bedroom. Um, and at the same time I was documenting a lot, like posting a lot of just, I would almost maybe once a week, a video, and then once a week, an article, just like, Hey, here are the things that I've, I've learned this week and here's what I'm working on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I was doing that. I would say, I think it was, I don't know the exact timeline again, but I think I've used in the past nine months, so let's call it nine months. I was nine months into studying my own curriculum full time. Um, and then a girl on LinkedIn sent me a message. And it turns out I used to work with this girl at, cause I was, I was posting on LinkedIn, right? I was sharing, I was sharing all these things that I was doing. Um, I had a blog, I had YouTube and look, this is, it's not for everyone, but this is just what I did. Um, and here's what happened from it. Um, a girl from LinkedIn messaged me and said, Hey, I've been seeing your, your posts on, on machine learning. I think that's like really cool and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think you should talk to Mike. And I'm like, okay, I'll talk to Mike. And I talked to Mike and it turns out Mike knew Cam who worked at a, a company in Brisbane and they were working on machine learning problems. And I'm like, well, here's what I'm working on. I was, this is me to Mike. I was like, well, I've been doing this. I've been, I created my own AI master's degree because I didn't really go on and back, didn't want to really go back to university. Um, I'm studying online. I'm just making all these things. I'd like to, to somehow get into machine learning and healthcare and all that sort of stuff. And he's like, oh, wow, you should meet Cam. Ended up meeting Cam. I told him the same story. Hey, Cam, I've been studying my machine learning master's degree. Um, I want to get in machine learning healthcare. Uh, I'm thinking about, uh, this is actually real. I was like, I was like at that point, like nine to 10 months in, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy a one-way ticket to the US and find a job at a startup somewhere and uh and just see what happens <laughs> um because in my mind i was like we could have hung out man uh, come on uh yeah uh, yeah we could have hung out you should have done it <laughs> um i was like in my in my head i was like well i've ai and machine learning is like taking over the world so there's going to be a bunch of startups and america's kind of where all the the technology and things happen so why don't i just go there and just work it out um so that was literally like my tentative plan. I hadn't bought the ticket yet, but I was like, that was what I was in my head. I was set on doing. And then Cam was like, well, why do you have to go to the US? You could just do it here. I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, we work on those sort of problems. Do you want to come in on Thursday? And this was like on a, on a Monday that I'd met Cam. And um, so shout out to Cam, shout out to Mike, legend. Um, 
And uh, I went in on the Thursday and it was kind of like a, a very informal internship. I like met the machine learning team, which is at, at that time was uh, two people. So I was the third person. And um, we just had a bunch of structured data that we were going through. And so I spent the day just exploring it with pandas. And so um, they asked me at the end of the day, I was like, do you want to come back next Thursday? And I was like, yep. And then I uh, went back on the next Thursday, did very similar thing, just more data exploration with pandas. Not even, I didn't even build a model yet. Um, and then I think it was the third or maybe the fourth Thursday, let's say the third, because I think it was only two. And then the third one, it was like about lunchtime. And then I went out with the CEO and the head machine learning engineer at the time. And they're like, hey, do you want to, do you want to roll? And I was like, sure, I'll have a, I'll have a roll. And then I spent the next year and a half working there um, on machine learning problems on a wide range of industries. Um, I actually started building models after that, <laughs> but there was a lot of data exploration. And so my takeaway from this is um, how did I get a job? I was, first of all, with anything, of course, you need some sort of skill, right? So that's a foundational thing. So it wasn't like I was just walking, I was posting these things online of like doing what I was doing without actually doing them. Um, so I was really just documenting what I was doing, which was studying all day because um, I had nothing else to do. I didn't have a job. I was driving Uber, oh, I did. I was driving Uber on the weekends to pay for courses um, and just studying this, this new machine learning thing uh, as much as I could because I was basically obsessed with it. And so whenever someone asks like, um, like what should I do for a job or what should I do in the interviews? I don't really have a great answer because I, I didn't actually, um, I didn't actually have a, a formal interview. It was literally like a sit down conversation. We had coffee. Do you want to come in on Thursday? Went in on Thursday, then got offered a role. But the first thing is of course, build skill. And I think everyone kind of knows how to do that because it's like you, you go through some courses, you work on some projects, yes. The second one that I think really helped me out because if, if we look back at that scenario, it was, I got lucky. I got lucky that someone saw my post and knew someone and then referred me to someone else. But the, the luck was kind of like pushed along by the fact that my work was, was there. And so if you I- You made a little of your own luck. Yeah. So there, yeah, there's that saying, you create your own luck. And so whether I did, whether I didn't like, if you just it's a, a thought a fun thought experiment to think if i didn't put anything out there would i have got that message probably not i don't think so um who knows but that's what i say to like people it's like okay you're building skill second of all is to to share your work and we've we've talked about this throughout this this little conversation here is that okay at the beginning it's is might not be very good like but that's not very good compared to the people that you're comparing to if you compare yourself if i compared my my nine month self of when i first started learning machine learning it was like a world apart when i first started of course i didn't didn't really know much but after i'd been into it for for nine months it was like wow i'm leaps and bounds of where i was and so day to day is like yes okay progress is going to disappoint but over the long run pro like if you're if you're being consistent if you're putting in effort progress surprises. So that's, that's a fun little saying there too. It's like in the short term, uh, progress disappoints, but in the long term, it surprises. So the way you can kind of, and I'm, I'm really bad at, um, so I've always had this thing as well is like with job, uh, applications. I pretend that if I apply through like a apply for this job button, like on a careers page or whatever, I pretend like it's an automatic no for me. So with any job or whatever in the past that I've tried to go for, I've always tried to have either an in or like I knew someone or um, I've like gone above and beyond rather than just sending through a resume. Cause I've oh, like, this is just me. I've always hated the concept of a resume. I remember when I was first making one for like some first job in high school, I'm like, what the hell? I can't. I can't put all like this crap about me on like one page and then someone looks at it and is like, oh yeah, this person, but that's just, that's just my take on it. So I kind of had to, if I go for like any role in the future, not that I'm looking for a job now, I, I probably won't apply directly through any sort of, any sort of job portal. I'm going to be doing everything I can to first of all, start the job before I have it. 
as in figure out what I the most ideal position I'd like to go for. Um, and if it doesn't exist, I'd probably just start creating it. That's kind of what, that's my advice to anyone who are, who, who's thinking about going a job, just create your own. Uh, but if you're actually going for a job somewhere at a company is figure out what it like, figure out what, what that person does day to day. And if you're smart enough to do research to like how to learn data sciences, how to learn machine learning, how to learn AI and all that sort of stuff, how to learn to code, you're kind of smart enough to do the same sort of research to figuring out what you're going to be doing day to day. Um, and again, it's sometimes it's just as simple as asking someone. And then you set up, this is a beautiful way to get experience before you even have a job, is you go, you take what someone's told you, you set up your own little project, and you go, well, I'm gonna do this for the next six weeks and work on this thing. And then when someone asks, do you have any experience? You go, well, yeah, I actually talked to this person, they said that they do this. And so I designed my own project and worked on this for X amount of time. It didn't quite work out how I'd want it to, but here's all the, the code that I wrote. Here's like the, the analysis that I did after it. And here's probably what I do next. I mean, to me, that's, if someone says that that's not experience, well, then you probably don't want to work there. Then they're um, wrong. <laughs> so that's a very, again, a long-winded approach to like how I got a job. For me personally, it was building skill, sharing my work, and then somehow the universe threw, threw an opportunity my way and I hopped on board. Well, you know, my, my biggest thing is that if you didn't share your work, like you said, there's virtually no probability of that happening at all. I, I talked with the guys over at uh, Sharpest Minds. Uh, so they do like a data science mentorship program and they have all this data on the people that they that they mentor. And through, through like LinkedIn or through some of these platforms, the like interview acceptance rate for applications is literally, it's I think it's between one and 2%. So yeah. like if you're applying, you apply to a hundred jobs, you'll get one or two call-ins for an interview for like the average person. It's absurdly low. And that's Almost, the average. Yeah. And if you know oh. about stats, the average is yeah. Can be don't cross misleading. the river if it's on average yeah. four foot deep. Yeah. <laughs> but so, you know, people will get really disappointed. They're like, oh, I only got like two calls out of 20 back. And I'm like, those are great. That's great numbers, man. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, almost every data scientist that I've talked to they did not get their job through a traditional route. And I think that that's a really, really important insight. And it's just highlighted in your story is that there are so many other ways to get noticed. There's so many like different things. And you, you brought up a bunch of really good ones of like, you know, actually just talking to these people and learning more and doing even informational interviews. Like if, if you come in with a better understanding of the company, than any other candidate, even if your data science or machine learning abilities are like, they're okay. Like you're gonna stand out so much because you've just done more homework. I mean, yeah. And is why people don't treat the interview process like they would treat a data science problem. You know, I, yeah. I always say like, okay, you know, people ask what skills should I learn um, to be desirable in the job market? My advice is take 20 job postings that you're like really excited about and just aggregate what skills they're looking for. You'll have like a yeah. ranked list of, of which ones want which skills. And so just changing that thinking and looking at it like, no, it's not an optimization of problem where if I apply to 500, I'll get this. And like, it's not a funnel. Yeah. There's way yeah, there's that, shortcuts. To and... me, that's, that's putting the, yeah, that's putting the cart before the horse that kind of way. Cause you, then you look, I just sort of this, like, I'd rather, instead of optimizing for the interview, like I'd rather optimize for the, the problems that I'm going to be working on. Um, exactly. So kind of doing it that approach, like it kind of just, it felt, it just felt backwards to me. And so I, and who knows, maybe that's just cause I just had no experience or whatever. But even now that I've, I've worked at a company and I've, I've like hired, per, hired people, I would, yeah. At the end of the day, like, if I've seen like someone's worked on something like then that's that's like miles above like not having anything out there. <laughs> awesome. So I have one last question. So I know you recently published a video, which was your 2020 machine learning roadmap. I'd love to understand from your perspective, what's your best advice for learning machine learning from scratch? Uh, it doesn't have to be long, but just like one or two things. 
Uh, also, people should definitely check out that video. I watched it. It is very in depth. So, um, <laughs> would, would love <laughs> would love any thoughts there. If you want a feature film introduction to machine learning, uh, <laughs> feature film length video, that's probably for you. Um, but yeah, the kind of the the really really high level overview for me, um, it's uh, look, people are gonna you're gonna. You're gonna, if you, especially if you're just getting started, like one of the first arguments you'll probably find yourself in is uh, people deciding whether what programming language they should learn. Um, so that's probably the, the, cause look, end of the day, if you wanna get in machine learning, you're writing either math or code. And I'm, I'm biased for the code part. So I like, I like writing code. Um, if you wanna get deep into the research, you're gonna be writing a lot of math. So you're going to have to learn to code. So this is from scratch. If you don't know anything, you're going to have to learn to code. And you're going to, the first thing you're going to face is, okay, I want to learn machine learning. You go, oh, there's a whole bunch of programming languages that I should learn or could learn. And now I spent probably two weeks when I first started learning, like in this eternal debate. And it just ended up being a, a whole bunch of wasted time. I should have just gone with the, just, just tried something out before, um, because you're a lot smarter when you're doing things than you are thinking about things. So if you want my very biased direction, I would say learn a programming language. It's probably going to be Python. Um, of course you can learn R, but this is, this is just my take. Learn Python. Why? Because there's a lot, a lot of resources out there. Um, especially when you get into the more advanced stuff, it's basically all Python. And then someone's going to ask, argue, like, Oh, why not Julia? It's this new language. Like, okay, well, you can do that. Just be aware that there's, because it's newer, there's not as many resources out there. So my approach, learn Python, very like approachable programming language. I'm not going to say easy because I hate it when people say things are easy to learn. Sometimes they're hard for people. Sometimes they're easy. Anyway, it's approachable. So learn Python and then you're probably going to, so this is when I say each of these steps, don't think of it as like something you can do like just over a weekend. Like this is like a three month per step. So learn Python and then you're probably going to learn how to work with data. And so if you're using Python, it's probably going to be the main three libraries you're going to work with uh, pandas, numpy and matplotlib. So pandas is to represent structured data, the things that you see in an Excel spreadsheet, which is probably the vast majority, despite what you see in terms of uh, what deep learning can do with unstructured data, which is images, video, uh, audio, that sort of thing. The vast majority of data you're probably likely to work with is structured data. Um, so, and even if you want to go into deep learning and things like image recognition, video analysis, etc., it's still very, very important to be able to just manipulate data. So this is where pandas, numpy, matplotlib come in. Those three, you could spend three months total on those. And now, again, I've been learning this for almost three years and I'm still learning all of these things. So what this is just what I'm, I'm like giving like a, let's say a year long sort of head first dive into machine learning, Python. And at the same time as you're doing all this, you want some concepts. So here we've got four things. We've got Python, just the programming language itself. We want machine learning concepts on the side. So you just get a broad overview of like, the general concepts of machine learning, like what the different types of learning are, what machine learning actually is. Um, then we want to be able to manipulate data with pandas, matplotlib and numpy. Um, numpy is numerical Python. So it's very similar to Python, but very a lot faster than Python at working with numbers, which is basically what data is. It's just patterns and numbers. And then we want to work with Possibly the most robust machine learning library that's out there at the moment is scikit-learn. So that is like the, how do you say? Just, you're probably gonna use that if you're working on machine learning problems because a lot of, actually, here's, here's a good thing. A lot of the deep learning libraries are actually based off uh, like scikit-learn structure. So we got five things now, Python, concepts, pandas, matplotlib, numpy, scikit-learn and if you're brand new um or me saying all of these things is probably going to sound like gibberish to you but trust me they'll 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 become part of your workflow then after that the natural progression to that is probably getting into some sort of deep learning and for that you're going to become you're going to find another debate is you're going to go 
oh, should I learn TensorFlow or should I learn PyTorch? Which is again, a waste of time debating that because you'll probably end up going to using both. Um, and these days, they're much of the muchness. They, they, they do very similar things. It's just different syntax. And so while you're learning these things, you're probably gonna be like, Daniel, where should I learn them? And you can do your research, you're smart enough. Uh, there is basically an unlimited amount of, of research that's out there. Um, oh, sorry, of resources that are out there to learn all of these things. Um, all of them are basically the same thing, just explained differently. So find something that resonates with you. And what's really helped me is working in small little sprints of, of like learning things. So it's like, say this month, I want to like two months ago, I read this book end to end. I'll right? link it below. I, I love that book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, if you're a complete beginner, I probably wouldn't recommend dumping straight into this. Like this is like you, you've never programmed before. If you have some Python experience, well then you could probably start reading this. Um, but if you've never like written any code before, which I mean, if you're watching this video, it's probably unlikely. You're probably already into data science and whatever. So if you are watching this video, get this book if you can. If you can't get this book, don't worry. All the code is on GitHub. You just have to, to go through it yourself which is, see, this is where I like the, what you're often paying for in paid resources for learning is someone has done the, the curation organization for you and put it, yeah, is put it into like a, a structured manner. Because as I said, you, if you wanted to learn Python, you could just read the Python docs. But there we have like the foundational tool, tool belt that you're going to be using. Now to put your knowledge really into practice, and this comes back to sharing your work is you want to at least every one to three months, depending on what you're working on, is work on at least some small scale project. And whatever timeline you dedicate to that is up to you, but I would usually recommend something that that's at least like a month long of, if you're working, maybe it's a month long of weekends. So it's like uh, four weeks of like just going, hey, I'm working on this one thing and I'm gonna, the first week I'm going to do data collection. The second week I'm going to do data modeling. This, the third week I'm going to try and improve my model. The fourth week I'm going to wrap it all up and, and, and share what I've found. Now, again, the timeline is arbitrary. How long you spend on each step is arbitrary. But the most important thing is courses, books, et cetera, et cetera, lay the foundational knowledge. You can't really start working on a project if you don't have any idea of anything. So you, you do need the foundational knowledge, but where the specific knowledge happens is when you start to work on your own things. And Ken and I talked about this before. Projects, something that might not work, something that interests you, something that makes you feel smart, happy, and useful. And the fifth one there can be uh, share it. <laughs> share your work. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, that's that's uh, really all I had. I think that this is super, super informative, not only for me, but hopefully for everyone watching as well. Uh, if you want to hear more from Daniel, you can check out his YouTube channel. I'll link that above and below. Uh, you can also check out his Medium posts. Um, he has a lot of great videos, a lot of great content. So um, definitely pay attention. Feel free to subscribe to his channel. He posts a lot of really good stuff. So thanks again for coming in and uh, looking forward to doing more similar stuff in the future. Thank you, Ken. It's been a blast. See you later, awesome. everyone.